You might like to continue with your Bibles open. You might like to turn back to Genesis chapter 9. Uh, for those who don't know, I didn't introduce myself before. My name's Rick, um, one of the pastors here. Uh, and it's, we've been going, starting, or we've been in a series in January, we're going to February, asking some of the tough questions of God's Word and therefore of God. And so we're going to ask a question today. Is God racist or is he hospitable? Is God racist? Like, I must admit, when you hear that sort of attack on the God who created every people from every nation and tribe and tongue and made them equal in his image, you want to say, have you ever read the Bible? If God was racist, why didn't he just make the people he liked? Well, he did make the people he liked. He made all of us, people from every nation, colour, tribe and tongue. We have been made equal in the image of God. That's the starting point of God's word. Now, I wish to answer this accusation, my job was done, but it would be easy to do it. But the problem is it's not. It would be very easy if I could just say, there you go, then we're right. In 1973, a bloke called William Jones wrote a book, Is God a White Racist? He was writing in a black American context, a context I've never lived in, but I've seen on TV, which is obviously not always going to be a good perspective of what happens but from his perspective what he experiences seems to indicate that the God of the Bible is a racist person or a racist God from his perspective it seems like God favors the white and gives the uh, people the people from uh, Africa or people from uh, dark skin uh, are looked down upon you can understand his confusion or his challenge or attack because in his world the passage that we read from Genesis chapter 9 was used terribly to justify slavery there you go God endorsed it I did a, a search I think it's good for us to um, uh, find make sure we get our terms right what what, uh, what does it mean to be racist and here's the top Google search. And the reason I just picked it is because then at least they've got their value for money because they paid for it. But more importantly, I don't just go and pick the, church, the, the definition I want. Here it is. A person, a racist is someone who is prejudiced against or antagonistic towards people on the basis of their membership uh, of a particular racial or ethnic group. Typically, that is a minority or marginalised group. So... In our culture today, in Western culture in particular, accusing Yahweh as being a racist is one of those things you can just say with no need to prove it. Everyone knows he is. And so we have prominent people who are hostile to the Christian faith just saying it because in their mind, it's a given. And then we have people who'd like to cancel Christians out from ever saying anything in Western culture and so they will use it as an unquestioned slogan. Of course Yahweh is racist. Is he? Or is he actually incredibly hospitable? That is, to find our terms, does the God of the Bible actually reach out to people of every nation and tribe and tongue and culture and welcome, welcome us into his kingdom equally? How about I pray, because this is a huge topic, how about I pray that God's word might speak to us uh, today. Our Lord and our God, we ask that in your goodness, uh, you'll help me to be clear, but I help, pray that you'll help us to concentrate, uh, help us to be shaped by your word, Lord. We, we really ask that your word will uh, challenge our hearts, because our hearts can be corrupted. And we ask this, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. I think it's important when anyone makes an accusation about what we believe about God not to dismiss what they've said. It's a terrible thing if we just dismiss what people hold on to as deep-seated beliefs. And so it's legitimate to ask the question, why is it that people think that the God of the Bible is racist? Here's three, I'm sure there's a lot more than this, here's three examples that are often given to show that God is racist. The passage we read from Genesis chapter 9, you know, you like to open your Bibles, I think it was chapter, verse, page 12, sorry, nice and easy to find, um, and that is often referred to as the curse of ham. Now, that's not talking about the stuff you eat, that's talking about a bloke, 
Um, they've been pinching the ham off the British people going through the tunnel, going into Europe. But anyhow, that's, that's not what they mean. The curse of ham is that if you are from the descendant of ham, now who is ham? He's one of the sons of Noah. If you're from the descendant of Ham, then you are cursed. And this passage proves it. That's what people argue. In a recent article written by a bloke who's a Gospel Coalition writer, Stephen Le Fure, I'm sure that's not how you pronounce his name, but that'll do. He, he was invited by a, a right-wing extremist group in his country to join them because, and this is what they said, Black African people were cursed race, descended from the Noah's son, Ham. These people are using this passage to justify their uh, right-wing views on people of a different uh, uh, nation, colour. This passage has been used to justify the Atlantic slave trade. It was used in Nazi Germany to justify the actions of people. It was used in apartheid South Africa to, to, uh, to justify the actions of people who claim to follow God. So what is the passage saying? Well, it's worthwhile reading passages slowly and carefully. And whilst people know it as the curse of Ham, it actually is not Ham who gets cursed. Look at verse 25. His son is Cain and is cursed. Now... The reason why people thought that meant that people from Africa with dark skin must be cursed is that they just assumed that Canaan went to Africa. Let me tell you, they were completely wrong. Both the Bible points it out and history points it out. I won't go into all the details, but the word, the name of one of Ham's other sons, Cush, actually is reflected of people with dark skin. Now, I won't go into all the details, we don't have the time here, but that probably means from his name and for the way that people in Africa have often dark skin, that that's where Cush went. There's no biblical record of this, cu- this curse being applied to Cush. Now, we know that Cush is fallen, a fallen sinner just like you and I, but we also read in chapter Genesis chapter 2, verse 17 last week, I think it was, that people were not cursed, creation was cursed. We were fallen when cursed. Anyhow, sadly, for people who wanted to promote their racist views, who misused this passage, they used this passage to justify the African slave trade. And they used it terribly. God is not a racist. God is not looking at people from a particular verse or a particular nation or tribe or tongue as being second-class citizens to be used as slaves for everyone else. That's what people do. So don't blame racism on Yahweh. Blame blame racism from the African slave trade on England and America and the people that existed around those days. They just simply grabbed a verse out of their Bible and used it for their own agenda, terribly. And the same happened in South Africa, and the same happened in Australia. The way that we treated Aboriginal people was justified in God's word, from God's word, but it was racist, British and and Australians. Now, just simply whilst we're looking at this passage of Genesis chapter 9, I'm not planning to unpack all of it, I'm just exposing the way it was misused. It is worthwhile noticing that Ham did something wrong. But what was it? It could have been simply seen his old man, Starkers. But it seems like a really bad curse to have just seen your old man. I know it's quite traumatising to have seen that, but it should have been actually Daddy got cursed, wouldn't it be? Canaan gets cursed, not Ham. What happens? Do you know what? People who follow God and people who don't follow God have speculated on this over and over and over again for an awful long time. It's 100% speculation. We don't know. It could have simply been that this passage that Ham did something wrong and his son Cain gets cursed actually prepares us for what follows the relationship between the Canaanites and the Israelites 
for a significant part of the Old Testament. Pardon me. We're going to look at, the, at that in a moment. A couple of other things as we look at this passage, chapter 9 of Genesis. Noah is the one who did the wrong thing. Notice that. He got tanked off his own fermented grapes. That's the first thing we should notice. Noah is not held up in this passage as a model of God living, godly living. And we also see that Noah is the one that gives the curse on Canaan. And we also know, as we've read through the Old Testament so far and continue, would continue as we went through, continue to see if we went through more of it now, that God seems to give some of these patriarchal figures the ability to bless or curse but their blessings and curses doesn't simply mean that God endorses what they say so that's really worthwhile so so what Noah says is not necessarily what God wants and we've seen plenty of times as we did Genesis all the way through to chapter 50 in the, over the last few years we've seen that some of these guys in the in Genesis are terrible role models so don't instantly take what Noah says as a great thing that God's behind anyhow that's worthwhile noting the second reason why people sometimes claim that God is a racist is that in Genesis chapter 12 God chooses Abraham as to be the father of his chosen people that sounds very racist doesn't it we didn't read it Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 to 3 But what we read in Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 to 3 is that God chose Abraham to be a conduit, a, a, a means by which God would bring blessing to all the nations. It wasn't a, let's do the Israelites and forget the rest. It was an all the nations focus. You've heard the gospel. Uh, let's assume that we've responded and followed Jesus. What does God want us to do? Be wise in the way we act towards outsiders so that outsiders might become insiders. There's plenty of other verses we could look at. God uses you to be a conduit of grace to a world that desperately needs... God used the Israelites to be a conduit of his grace to a world that desperately needed it so that they could come to know him. God chose Israel. But many people in the Old Testament get to join Israel. Remember, as they left in the Exodus, it just a throwaway line that a whole pile of other people joined them. That's God's heart. Rahab joined them. Ruth joined them. In fact, if you read the genealogy of Jesus in Luke or Ma, Matthew, sorry, you see there's plenty of non-Israelite people in the family tree of Jesus. You see, God doesn't say, because you're from this tribe, you can't ever be part of my kingdom. God invites people from every nation and tribe and tongue into join him. Now, Israel were not always good at being conduits of God's blessings to the nations. And that just highlights the grace of God and the failure of people just like you and me in being obedient. God's not a racist. He chose them to bring his blessings to a world that desperately needed to know about God. Well, the third reason that's often claimed that proves that God is a racist is that God tells his people on the Exodus or coming to the end of the Exodus to go into the promised land and claim it for yourselves and drive out the Canaanites that are there. Wipe them out. Now, this is a huge topic. You want to get to the bottom of it? It would take you a few weeks or months. We won't try it this morning. The Bible refers to God sending his people in to wipe the Canaanites out. Let's refer them all together. But it doesn't seem to mean that that's what they are to do literally. In fact, the Bible says... We've done what you ask, God, and then we've wiped them all out. And then a few chapters later it says it speaks about them again because there are still people there. So what is the Bible saying when it says, God says, go in and clean the land up? 
They say, yes, Lord, we've done that. And then a few chapters later, the people are there again. That's a huge question. I'm not going to unpack that now. But one thing that we must note is that when God commands them to wipe them out and they obey and there's still people there, we might need to question our assumptions of whether that's a literal, completely removing everything. Now, that doesn't answer the question though, does it? Because even if 50% of them survived, is God still racist? Is God still saying, go in and wipe out this nation and only kill 50% of them, take their land off them? Well, God sends them in to take the land off the Canaanites, but not because the Canaanites are a particular nation, tribe or tongue. God sends them in to punish them for their wickedness. That is a huge difference. The Canaanites were not a nice people. In fact, the Bible describes them as exceedingly wicked. And just for the record, if they are living in the Middle East, they're not living in Africa, are they? The, the Canaanites uh, worshipped false gods and offered their children up to their false gods. You can only guess how. The Canaanites uh, practised sorcery, uh, that is, magic that doesn't come from God. The Canaanites love just trashing the neighbours. It's a good way to keep your neighbours from giving you a hard time later if you just went in and gave them a beating around the head every so often. The Canaanites love doing that stuff. They were not a nice bunch of innocent people. God did not randomly pick on them because of their skin colour or he didn't like the way they spoke. Genesis chapter 16 verse 15 prepares us for what God is doing. And he says, when the people of this land's sins have reached their limit, I will bring them to account. And so when he sends his people in to take the land off them, guess what? Their sin has reached its limit. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The sovereign Lord of all the universe will bring people to account. Now, you might say that just proves that God's a racist. What does he do with Israel? What does he do with his own chosen people who uh, do get into the habit of being just as wicked as the Canaanites were? Well, the Assyrians uh, are sent by God in to remove the ten northern tribes from their land and they never existed again. Uh, the Babylonians are sent by God to carry off into exile, remove the two southern tribes a little later you see when God's people do the same as the Canaanites did God punishes them for their sin the same as he did for the Canaanites the sovereign lord of all the universe is the judge of all the nations he's not racist but he does bring sin to account and people from every nation and tribe and tongue including his own people of Israel now the conquest which is this whole topic is a massive topic and last week I mentioned a book by a guy called Paul Copan that was asking, looking at some of the tough passages in the, in the Old Testament and the book was called Is God a Moral Monster? Paul and another bloke have also written a book called uh, Did God Really Command Genocide? I, I would lend it to you but I know that means I'll probably never see it again and I always seem to need it so go and buy your own copy, it means you get to read it yourself and you can then lend it out to people, it's a worthwhile book to read. Uh, did God really command genocide? He, he does the hard yards that you and I should be doing with God's word. It's a worthwhile book to look at the topic. We're, there's lots to raise. We do need to move in. I did ask, is God a racist? But there was also another question, or is he hospitable? I said it before, but let me keep saying it because I think we need to really grasp this. Is that when God made us, people from every nation, tribe and tongue, well there weren't nations then, but God made everyone equal in his image. Now there's not actually different races, did you know that? We're not different genetic gene pools, we're, we're not, we, we are humanity. 
We are people made in the image of God. I know there's different worldviews that like to break in, us down into different types of better humanity and worse humanity or more developed or less developed, but that is humanity being racist. God is not a racist. He made us one blood in his image. What does God tell his people to do with people of different ethnic backgrounds as we move our way through the Old Testament? Well, sometimes he actually says, keep away from these bunch of people. But he doesn't do that because of their wrong skin colour or their dodgy languages. He does it because he doesn't want his people to adopt false gods. In fact, God commands his people that anyone who wants to join you should be allowed to. Not to join you as a superior nation, but join you as the people of God. Have a look at Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. This is part of a sermon. Uh, Moses is speaking. He's just before they go into the promised land. Moses drops dead at the end of five sermons. You can understand that. You probably wish the bloke out the front dropped dead earlier. And five sermons in a row, you certainly would. Well, anyhow, this is what he says. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the wicked. He loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love these, uh, are those who, and you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. That is God's command to his people on how to treat people who, from different nations, tribes and tongue who want to join them. Did God actually practice what he promised? Let's have a look at a couple of case studies really quickly. Uh, the first study comes from the second Bible reading we had from 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman is the enemy commander of the dominant forces of Syria. And, and he goes on raids, and on one of his many raids, he's gone into Israel and captured a young girl whose name we don't know, and she's used as a slave for Naaman's wife. Now, we read that Naaman's a brilliant uh, military general, but he's, a, he's got dodgy health, he's got leprosy, and here's something important to know about leprosy, and you see it in the king of Israel's response. Who can cure leprosy? God and God alone. So when Jesus cures leprosy, what does he do to the guys? He says, go and, go and show it to the priest. What is Jesus claiming in the New Testament? To have the power and authority to do what only God can do. Let's come back to the story. Uh, the king of Israel is quite fearful because he knows he's not God. The king of Israel is completely ignorant about Elisha. He doesn't know, seem to know that Elisha even exists. In fact, He should be saying, but he doesn't, well, there's nothing nothing I can do about that. How about you go along to Elisha, our prophet? He's the guy who connects with God, and as you know, only God can cure leprosy. But he doesn't say any of that. Anyhow, eventually, Elisha hears that Naaman's been seeking after someone to cure his leprosy, and um, Elisha sends for Naaman. Then doesn't even bother to meet him at the front door. And sends a servant out to say, go and wash in the Jordan. That's like saying, go and wash in the Torrens. The, the Jordan's not a nice, pretty river that's, you know, crystal clear water and lots of trout in it. Um, and so Naaman thinks, oh, we've got better rivers where I came from. Why would I go in your stinking river? But eventually, his wise servant says to him, yep, yeah, okay, well, let's go and do it. You, you go and do it. If it something. And this is what God, why God did it. Why did God allow this to all happen? Why are we told about it? Look at verse 15. Naaman from Syria, a non-Israelite country that gives the Israelites a hard time, gets to discover that the king, something the king of Israel has not the foggiest about. Now I know that there is no God in all the world except Israel. You see, God in his grace is inviting people into his kingdom from different nations, tribes and tongues. Now, there's plenty of other examples. I just picked on, on one from the Old Testament there. There was another one to come. But you see all the way through, there's Nebuchadnezzar. He's one of the Babylonian kings. There's the Egyptians I've already mentioned. There are many references to God's people to love the foreigners among them because there's always foreigners among them because God wants people to join his people so that they may know about him. 
What about the New Testament? Let's move it quickly. One of the stories you know a lot about, the Good Samaritan. We didn't read the story. Luke 10, verse 25 to 37 is one of the recordings of it. Um, The guy from Israel gets beaten up and the people from Israel don't bother helping him because, well, we can only speculate, but there's lots of good reasons. Um, But the guy from Samaria comes and he helps. But the Samaritans, as you know, if you know the story, is one of the enemies of God's people. They're the terrible foreigners up there. We don't want anything to do with them. We've been at war with them. They're, you know, false followers of God. Now, this, Jesus tells this parable because a guy who was an expert in the law asked a question, who is the neighbour that I must love? Well, he didn't ask that, but that's really the question he asked. Um, who, what, who, who, who's my neighbour? God, God said, love the Lord your God with your heart and soul and mind. Who's my, love your neighbour yourself. Who's my neighbour? And Jesus says to this guy, your neighbour, the one that you must love, is your worst enemy. That's if you want to live in a God-honouring way. The people group you hate the most, that is the people that you must love the most. Or love. Now, just cut to the chase so we know where God's word is going. Let's go to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. This is a picture of heaven. God's people gathered around the throne. Verse 9, it says, And after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. It's the biggest number in the Bible. From people from every nation, tribe, t- people, and tongue, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white, white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. It's a picture You don't have to have a literal white robe and a literal palm branch. It's a picture, though, of people from every nation, tribe and tongue gathered around the throne. And who are those people? They're people who've been redeemed. They're people who've been adopted in to God's kingdom. That God's grace has been poured upon. People from every nation, tribe and tongue. And guess what? That includes me and you. That's good news, isn't it? So does God practice what he preaches? I think he does. He invites us all to join him. So why do people accuse God of being racist and not hospitable? Oh, I reckon there's lots of reasons. I can just pick the ones I like, can't I? There are people who like to shut down arguments and they think that works, so they give it a go. There are people who want to cancel Christians out, so you can't say anything because you're God's racist. Don't have to prove it, but once I've said it, you have to keep quiet. But I think there's actually a bigger and probably more people have this, co- this feeling, uh, reason that we need to deal with. You know, I think people have often encountered sinful Christians. In fact, they do all the time because we start our service acknowledging that fact that you and I are sinners. And last week we asked, is God sexist? And we saw that God is actually not sexist, but plenty of people who follow him are. Uh, God is not actually racist, but plenty of people who follow him are. It happens all around us. Not intentionally sometimes, sometimes terribly, yes, it does happen intentionally. But do you know what? Racism is deeply embedded in your history, regardless of where you come from. Now, when I saw the Australian cricketers' uh, crowds, the crowds at the cricket getting given a hard time, um, because they supposedly did or didn't do something. I want to jump to their defence and say, say it up, princess. I don't even know what they said, and that's what I'm feeling. The country that we live in has got an incredibly racist past, and the churches, regardless of what denomination you come from or have been in or in now, are filled with sinners who are f- often people who are racist. Let, let, let me... Just unpack some of our background. I'm not accusing you of being a racist, capital R. But if you read the book by One Blood, One Blood by John Harris, I've got a picture of it, I think. This one, you can't buy it. It's out of print, $80. You can get it on, on Kindle for, for $10. It's a thick book because it's an awful lot to cover. It's a book you won't be able to put down. It's a book you should read if you want to understand the way that we, as a country, have treated the Aboriginal people. It's worthwhile. You will be traumatised by what you read. 
You see, if you think that our country has a clean history, you are ignorant of reality. You must read that book. You know what? Early Australian settlers are people that were Christians and people that were pseudo-Christians. Both thought that the Aboriginal people were expendable. They were incredibly racist. People were killed just for the colour of their skin and been in the wrong place at the wrong time. They are treated like dirt by our governments and our churches. Now it's so easy to criticise the past. We're, not, we're sort of saying, well, you guys, you, we didn't live there. We don't know what it was like. Racism doesn't change. It just becomes more or less excusable in some, in some respects. Yet it's worthwhile us saying, well, we might have not have done that now, but what do we do now? Let's actually turn the question back to ourselves and ask, do I treat people from different cultures and ethnic backgrounds equally, people made equally in the image of God? I say that's the question we need to be asking ourselves. Not, not getting upset that other people have done terrible things in the past, although we sh- should do that, not just doing that. We want to ask ourselves, how do I respond? Uh, there's one final point I do want to raise. Um, people in our culture today claim that only white people can be racist. That's rubbish. Racism happens in every culture. Ask the Tutsis. They were, 800,000 of them in a short term, 1994, wiped out by the Hutus. None of them were white. The Uyghurs in China. Kurds in the Middle East. The Armenians in 1915. There's just three or four that just flowed out of my thinking in two and a half seconds. White cultures, and let me make the point, people from any culture can be racist towards any other culture. But we as Christians are not to. Racism is not just something that is confined to majority cultures. It happens from minority cultures. The problem with majority cultures is that if a majority culture is racist, more people get hurt. I've raised a huge question, huge topic, haven't I? Um, a topic that many of us can naturally respond defensively over. Now, I've only scratched the surface. Uh, how about we pray that God's word does its work in our lives, shall we? Thank you, Lord, uh, for the opportunity to gather together as your people. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you draw people from every nation, tribe and tongue into your kingdom. We look forward to that day uh, when our sin will no longer taint us. Uh, Lord, we, are, we pray, Lord God, that between now and then, uh, we will not be naive to our own sinfulness in this area. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'll help us to welcome people from every nation, tribe and tongue as equal people made in the image of God. Help us to keep pointing them towards you and help us to love them like you've commanded us to. And we ask this, Lord, in your precious name. Amen.